Thank you, Molly. I uh, shared with the first service, I, I warned them that it was going to be potentially an emotional song. Uh, Molly even questioned whether it was quote unquote Jesus enough <laughs> because uh, I have heard all my life and I've preached all my life and I believe it with everything I have. It's not about this building ultimately. Amen, church? This building is just that. It's a building. It's about this building getting that building inside this building. And we're going to talk more about that. But God uses buildings to introduce himself to eternal buildings. And I don't think there's anything wrong with praising God and thanking him for using those buildings uh, that mean so much for us. We're just going to take the opportunity, and if you're a visitor, you just need to know that we operate this way on occasion, uh, and we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, but uh, years ago, Denise, I don't know if you remember a conversation, and I mean, it was years ago. I don't even think Dawn and I were married at that point, but we were talking about possible plans. The church was on a growth pattern. This was when I was a youth director, and I made the statement to Denise that we hope as a staff, to be up on that hill someday. And boy, she turned on me and said, oh, I don't want to leave this building. And I just looked at her like she had three heads, you know, because the, the difference between Denise and I is that this was the only building that she knew up to that point uh, before college and such. I moved every two years. So I don't have any issue or problem with leaving a building. But now that I've been here 26 years, as your pastor, eight years as your youth pastor, I get it. I get it. God has done some amazing things in our lives in this building. And, and that gives an attachment. It's kind of like Camp Garwood back in the day. And then hopefully Jesus Camp with our young folks and such. You, you, you remember where you were when God changed your life. And, and amen to that. And the neat thing about that particular song is that Molly's grandfather did preach the gospel for 16 years in this church, S.F. Burnett, up to when I came, Brad and I, we broke that record because of God, uh, but up to that point, S.F. was the only person that had lasted 16 years at this church. Church, you want long-tenured pastors and staff. Amen. You want long-tenured pastors and staffs. Rich Hoff wisely said, I want a preacher that will stay here long enough to marry us and bury us. Amen. Well, you got to stay a while to get that honor and privilege. Uh, and Brother Rich was wise beyond his years. And so, but not only did he, her grandfather preach at this church and pastor this church, her dad fell in love with her mom at VBS. Scandalous. <laughs> Dawn was up here leading the kiddos. I don't know, were you in college at that point? She was in college, and she was leading the kiddos in Jesus songs, and I was walking. We, that's when we did VBS during the day, okay? And I was walking to my office, which was over there at the time, and I looked at that woman, and I thought, man, I got to have her. <laughs> And in the, in the most righteous way you can imagine. And that was the start of me pursuing her. I fell in love with her. Because, now, I gave this to the first service, and I don't know what those 60-year-olds uh, are going to do with this advice, but we, we got young folks here, and I'm kidding. There was a lot of young people there at first service today. But young people, please hear me. The best advice out there for how to find your forever person is from Ravi Zacharias from I, Isaac Take Thee Rebecca book. I heard it on the radio when I was a single man. You fall asleep in Jesus, and you run for Jesus as fast as you can, and God will bring the opposite sex up with you someday who's running for Jesus as fast as they can, and God will say, why don't you two just run together? That's the best advice I know to give you to find the forever loved one for you. And 31 years in, it, you know, I hope it's going to work out. You know, and I miss, thank you for laughing. It's a joke. Uh, but nonetheless, Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24. Uh, it's kind of a practice here to say that, you know, today's service is going to be kind of unique. 
Uh, it's just kind of the way we operate. But in October, we took the BAMO assessment. 112 people. It's the best assessment we've ever, as far as just numbers of people. And even though our scores do not necessarily reflect what we hope and pray they will, I've seen God bless and work through that assessment. And so we're going to look at three assessments. You'll be familiar with every one of them to make sure that we stay on course. This is a very timely situation because Don, Molly, and I are going to the National Association of the Baptist Missionary Association in Branson, Missouri, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, essentially. Uh, but Tuesday and Wednesday will be the main two days that we will be ho hosting a booth as your missions director, BAMO, Baptist Missionary Association of Missouri. And at that booth, we're going to be pushing the assessment for churches to assess how well they are doing. Well, what I want to do to dive into this approach is I want us to look, and, and the, Brother Keith, I always remember uh, your testimony of your pastor back in the day. He would preach on tithing every month of January, and every month of January, somebody would get saved. And so, even if you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't know what assessments are going to have to do with what I'm going through right now, I promise you this, the Holy Spirit can connect it. And I believe that God is changing lives through the preaching of his word and through the ministry of Bethel Baptist Church, and I believe he wants to do it today. And if you're sitting here today, it's no accident. He wants to take you from where you're at to the next step in your journey of following him. So let's start in Joshua chapter 24. We're going to look at verse 14 and 15. Before we stand, this is Joshua at the end of his days, these are the last words that Israel hears from him before he dies. This is the conclusion of the picture of what happened with the children of Israel in Egypt. So Egypt in the Old Testament is a picture of bondage of sin. And Israel was under that bondage for 400 years. God delivered them through Moses. Moses was a Christ type. And Moses led them out of Israel, and they were supposed to go into the promised land, which is the abundant life in Christ picture in the Old Testament. But what did they do? Lack of faith. Two spies said, we can take it. God has given it to us, Canaan. And ten spies said, nope, they're bigger than us. God's setting us up for failure. What? God does not set you and I up for failure. He does not do that. And so they believed the 10 spies, the 10 liars. And you know what happened? For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't want you wandering. He wants you thriving. And the only way you and I are going to thrive is to believe him. And after that 40 years, he raised up Joshua, the son of Nun. And Joshua said, God, I'm your man. I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. And he did it. And at the end of his life, this is what he tells the nation of Israel. Will you please stand for the reading and reverence of God's holy word? I hope and pray every person under the sound of my voice has dealt with that challenge. I will do what God calls and asks me to do. If you haven't accepted that challenge, I hope that today is the start of that. But we're looking at a person that had dealt with it and done it, and now before he goes, he wants his nation, if you will, the leader, wants the people to know. Look at verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt... And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, because there's always free will, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, we ask you to add your blessings to the reading and preaching of your holy word. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. 
I'm curious if you're tempted to think, well, Brother Ben, that, that's, that's great. For you preacher types, for you politician types, for you big leader types, that's great. I don't do any of that. In other words, I'm, I'm giving you the words that you might be thinking, the words that the devil, your flesh, or the world might be telling you. Brother Ben, that whole leadership, serve the Lord your God, that, that's all for you types. Please hear me. No, this is for every type of human there is. This isn't limited, quote unquote, to leaders. This is limited to every person that has a life. You've been given a soul and a spirit. And God wants you to make up your mind. I'm going to serve the Lord. This life is going to serve the Lord. Watch this. When you and I do that, we become a leader of our sphere of influence. Because your life starts to change. God loves you enough to tell you to quit saying that. God loves you enough to say, quit listening to that. God loves you enough to say, quit reading that. Quit exposing yourself to that. Look more like me, Jesus says. And then he gets you into his book. And he shows you how. You know, I've said this over and over and over, but I just never get over it. If you want to know what a book is saying, you talk to the author. Well, if you know Jesus Christ, the spirit of Jesus Christ lives inside of you. And so if you're having trouble understanding God's word, you need to ask the author. You can ask Dawn, I don't always say it, but I always strive to pray this prayer before I read God's word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead, guide, and direct my every thought concerning your word, my life for you, and your ministry in my life. Church, that's just simply a prepared prayer that I pray with sincerity because that's what I want to happen. Life change happens because we let God change us through his word and through his spirit. And so we ask this question, what's the course? Because you see, today is three assessments that will keep you on course. Well, what's the course? What is God's general will? Will. I did the same thing in first service. Will. I'm going back to Arkansas. So it's not W-H-E-E-L. It's W-I-L-L. What is God's general will for your life? Now, it's going to sound like preacher words. It's going to sound familiar. Don't you dare do that. Listen again for the first time in your life. Make a choice. I'm going to listen. This is God's course for you. The great commission. He wants every one of us involved. And if that just washes over you and doesn't affect you, you need to be revived. If that doesn't shake you, if that doesn't stir you for your sphere of influence... You've gotten comfortable. The great commission. The great commandment. The great confession. The great commission is, go ye therefore, teach all nations. What are you teaching them? <laughs> Jesus Christ came and died for your sins. Teach them. And then when they come, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One of the most shocking things in my ministry was when someone tried to uh, diminish the importance of someone following the Lord in baptism as if it's no big deal. Church, we've gotten too comfortable in America because when people got baptized in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, the New Testament days, it was a death sentence. And they were saying publicly, I'm willing to die for Christ. And even though, praise the Lord, right now we're not having to do that, we should be willing to do that. And that's why I, I always try to tell people, this, this means a lot more than what it may seem. But you're identifying with Christ. You're taking a stand with Christ. The Great Commission is what you and I are to be all about. Well, Brother Ben, I'm struggling with that. Well, that's why we need to concentrate on number two then. The great commandment, Mark 12, 30, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And yes, the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. 
And so that's the core principle, love God, love others. You are commanded to do that. You and I should never wake up wondering, what am I going to do today? You're going to carry out the Great Commission, and you're going to love the Lord your God with everything you have. But Brother Ben, I get it. We live in this flesh. It's hard. I get it, but I'm going to give you something right now. Stop it. Stop giving excuses. Stop saying it's so hard. Can you imagine what that sounds like to God? God, I would live for you, but, you know, and you kick something. It's just so hard. And God goes to that cross, and he sees Jesus do the hardest thing on this planet, and that is to pay the price for something that he didn't do. You know, our society is built on justice. Our society is built on self-government It's one thing for you and I to get in trouble for something we did, but it's a totally different thing for us to get in trouble for something that we didn't do. And Jesus did just that. He paid the ultimate price for yours and my sin. Church, I believe with all my heart, if we allow ourselves to ask the question or say to God, yeah, I would, but we haven't walked to the cross soon enough. We haven't had that visual experience recent enough where we see the bleeding, dying form of Jesus for yours and my sin. That's not me. So that's somebody else. It's okay. There's nothing can interrupt us right now. Watch this. The Spirit of God is brooding in here. Hear me. So how do you and I carry out the great commission, the great commandment, and the great confession? What is the great confession? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So the next time that the Holy Spirit convicts you to do something and you say, I would, but change it. Church, you can train yourself to do the right thing. You can train yourself to say the right thing. You can train yourself to live the change that God wants to do in your life. I used to cuss like a bunch of you. That was supposed to be funny. I used to cuss, but I didn't cuss like some of you that use the real words. Because I was a preacher's son. I I could get in big trouble if somebody heard me say the S word or the, you know, whatever word you want to fill in there. So I came up with my own cuss words. Bird, dog, shoot, far, you know. Watch this. The Holy Spirit loved me and my righteousness enough to even put a circle around those words. And he's like, Ben, I have told you in all things rejoice. Rejoice. So quit cussing. Even your own cuss words, Ben, they're cuss words to me. Quit. So I train by his power, I train myself instead to say, praise the Lord. Now, can I tell you, at 58, it's getting harder. (laughs) It's getting harder. Ken Burnett's favorite word is sometimes my favorite word if I'm not careful. And I'm just talking about when things don't go right. So I'm having to retrain. It's a a constant battle. Praise God. The Lord. Well, you can train yourself that the next time the Holy Spirit calls you to do something, instead of you fighting it, you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, I'm going to do this. By your grace and power, I'm going to do this. It will change your life. And so these are simply three assessments to help us do that. The first one you are very familiar with, but we're just going to love you enough to push it like crazy. It's called the Bethel Approach. And this is what we're asking every person in the, under the sound of my voice to memorize this. I've asked that for quite a while. I'm going to start inspecting it. We have about four or five videos ready to go. When we start this, we're going to have them, and we, I would invite you to make a video. Uh, we're going to get with Brad and make sure that, you know, you're doing it in a way that we can utilize it and the such. So that's going to be coming to a pulpit near you. But we've got four or five of those videos ready to go soon of people that you will know, that you will recognize, that have memorized the Bethel approach, and they've made a video of it, and we want it to catch on, and we want every person that claims to be a member, attender of Bethel to know this. What is it? Bethel to the world. Knowing Christ, living Christ. Church, this is the gospel. This is the first thing. When you meet person X, and they don't know anything necessarily about the gospel, but they know you, at some point in time, 
in your experience and existence with them, you need to introduce to them Christ. And if they say, well, hey, I know you go to church, but what is it all about? We're about you, sir, ma'am, boy, girl, knowing Christ and living Christ. Uh, I'm not going to say his name yet, but the young man that we're, we're hopefully going to baptize on a couple Wednesdays, uh, the only reason that we're talking about that is because one of our members here, Alex, has you know, drummed up a friendship with him at Awana, just talks to him before and after Awana, and he said, hey, are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And this boy, he perked up and said, yeah, I got saved at Awana last year. And Alex said, last year? Yeah. Well, I haven't, have you been baptized? No, but I want to. <laughs> it just came about from a conversation. Church, know Christ live Christ. That's who we are to the world. But I believe, in my humble opinion, this is not going to happen the way it needs to happen until number two happens, Bethel to Bethel. Know your name, live your name. Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. Say it with me, church. Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. Very good. Bethel, house of God, to have a personal relationship with Christ. Let's go to this word real quick. This comes from uh, Jacob's experience, I believe. Uh, I get those Old Testament names mixed up. But Jacob, the supplanter, the trickster, had tricked his uh, older brother out of his birthright, and he was running for his life. And while he was running for his life, doing his own thing, Remember somebody told me this the other day, Brother Ben, you remember when you said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans? She said, I'm just living that almost every day, you know? So watch this. Jacob was telling God his plans, and God interrupted his plans. And at that place where God met with Jacob, very similar to this situation today, Jacob said, this must be God's house. Watch this, church. You know what is God's house today? Right here. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body, your heart and soul is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And church, you could sum up our entire existence too. We're just trying to get the kingdom of God into the kingdom of man. When we can get God into the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls, we'll change this world. And God knows that. And that's why it's his plan. So Bethel, know your name, live your name. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That means, again, you're going to let him tell you what you're going to think, what you're going to see, what you're going to watch, what you're going to spend your money on. Fill in the blank. And if you react to that, I get it, but we need to get right with God and let him have a personal, vibrant love relationship with God. Number here we go, missionary. You are a self-support missionary to Franklin County. During Sunday school, I did a little bit of research because my numbers were old. We have 105,000 people that live in Franklin County. 105 in this rural community. 1,000. We're going to have around 220 to 260 today. Watch this. We got a lot of work to do, church. We got a lot of work to do. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, Brother Ben, we're not the only ones here, and you're 100% right. We got all sorts of great churches throughout Franklin County, but put them all together, I bet we're not reaching 20,000. Well, y'all do the math. You know I can't. That's a lot of lost people out there. That's a lot of people that you and I are on the hook for, if you will, to share the gospel to. I realize by some of you saying, Brother Ben, I don't know what this means. I don't know what self-support mission is, so let me break it down real quick. We're going to go to the mission symposium, and we're going to meet some full support missionaries uh, from the BMA to the world. We started this when we started the Bethel assessment. This is one of the questions on the assessment. Do you have a map at your church or at your home? And so this is to help us realize that we're not just trying to reach Franklin County. We're not just trying to reach the state of Missouri. We're trying to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. So we have some full-time missionaries. What does that mean? We pay their salary. A percentage of the monies that you give in that little treasure box goes to these missionaries so we can pay them a monthly support. That's not you and I. That's not you and I. You see, if God hasn't called you to Zambia, if God hasn't called you to fill in the blank, he's called you to where your address is. Ben Kingston and Don Kingston have been called to 641 Bethel Church Road to share the gospel. Now, I get my support from this church, so I can't really even call myself a 
self-support, but every person, man, woman, boy, and girl, that doesn't get their support from a quote-unquote religious institution, guess what? You are a self-support missionary. We need you to buy in. We need you to absolutely live that on a daily basis. Baptist, know and live the distinctives of what it means to be a Christian. This is discipleship. Brother Ben, I don't know how to pray. That's the church's responsibility to teach you. I don't know how to share the gospel. That is the church's responsibility to teach you, so on and so forth. But watch this. At some point, you got to feed yourself. And we need to know the distinctives of the Word of God. Church, we have a personal responsibility to one another and to our community. Nobody's going to want to come here if we don't love each other. Nobody, and I wouldn't blame them. In church, when somebody goes down, we need to help one another. Something the Lord, and I'm not doing this for any other reason that it just came up this week, and I'm not patting myself on the back because I've, we know people that have been doing this for years, and it's starting to rub off on the preacher. That when you make some food, make a little extra. Put it in the freezer and be ready so that when you hear that somebody has some issues, you can take them a covered dish. Y'all ever heard or seen that joke that when the archaeologists come across the Pyrex dish 2,000 years from now, they're going to say, this has something to do with a Baptist church <laughs> because of potlucks and, and all. A, amen. And so uh, a couple weeks ago, we made some lasagna. We made it for a church function. I can't even remember now what it was, but we made it. And I had some extra. Put it in the freezer. And the Holy Spirit, poink. Dummy. Jerry had a shoulder surgery. Amanda's waiting on him. Hand and foot. You can say amen, Amanda. And they like one of those lasagnas. I said, yes, sir. I took it to them. And even though Benjamin thinks that it's too cheesy, bless Benjamin's heart, there's, there's some problems there. Yeah, there's no such thing as too cheesy, folks. That's like having too much money and many other things we could say we won't. We're going to keep it family. Watch this. It was a blessing. Church, I promise you, hands could go up all over the place. As we get better at serving one another, God's going to bless this church. And I think we do a pretty good job. Please don't get me wrong, but I, there's always room for improvement. So this is one of the best assessments that we're going to do. This is our approach. Assessment number two is that uh, BAMO assessment that we did in October. And so we don't have time because, boy, I thought I had time. Uh, when I looked at this at first service, I was out of time. But uh, just to give you an idea, uh, we have went all that we're going to be doing, uh, if the Holy Spirit leads, a forensic deep dive on some of these things because we scored very low. I was thrilled that we had as many people uh, do it. I was thrilled that we had so much honesty, but we've got some work to do to bring these scores up. Watch this. As we bring these scores up, you know what that's going to do? God's going to bless that because the scores represent you and I doing what God wants us to do. So what I need your help with, and the only thing we're going to address today is that we've got it all done. I know the percentages that this church scored on every question, thanks to my lovely wife, but now we need your help. I don't know how many have done it. Have you gotten any responses from first service? She hasn't looked, so there you go. But, you know, first service don't even have smartphones yet, but I'm, I'm messing. <laughs> don't tell them. Don't tell them I said that. Ooh, they'd get me in trouble. And if they've got one, they don't know how to use it, right? And I, I'm talking to myself. My kids have shown me how to use the thing. Take a picture of this. It'll take you to the assessment. Assess, and then just simply hit submit. And then Dawn, at some point, will grade it and give you your result. And that, because we're doing this at the National Association, we want a test run. So today, it'll take you, what, two minutes, maybe five, to do of the test. I, I did it. I scored very well. I did not score very well the first time I took it, okay? But now I've changed some things in my life. I'm doing some things that I wasn't doing before, and I believe I'm also seeing God's blessings as a result. Please hear me. This pastor has never, will never preach and teach that if you do, you'll get. I'm, I'm not talking about that. But what I do preach is that as a child of God, as you serve him, you will receive his favor. You will. 
you will receive his favor. Uh, and so these are up here. Uh, is there one in the back, Molly? Beautiful. Thank you, Craig. They're placed everywhere, she says. So please uh, get you, you know, take the picture. If you got a smartphone, you probably know what to do. So uh, you would help that. Uh, number three, and we're almost done. Number three assessment is the three chairs. Oh, we're doing famously on time. So I want you to see, and we've covered this many, many times. This come from Brother Brad. That came from Brother Donnie, I think, at a uh, Youth Alive conference. So you got three chairs. And this, I think, is from a book from Bruce Wilkinson, I think. Does that sound right, Gavin? The th hey, he doesn't know. He don't read. All right. Now, <laughs> shooting at everything that moves today. All right. He'll get me back. He'll get me back. The, fir <laughs> the first chair is you are at zero, but you know Jesus, you love Jesus, or you're trying to learn if you should love Jesus and you want to know Jesus, but you're in this first chair, you are trying to learn. This is hopefully everybody in this room. You are sharing with this person about how to know Jesus, how to love Jesus, and discipleship and the such, but you are also receiving from someone. Most of our folks, and I say that, I'd say 70% of our folks either attend CR or Sunday school or Awana. Why? Because we know that we need help. We need someone outside of ourselves that loves us enough to tell us about ourselves the truth, and we take it in. Well, then when you take it in, you turn to this person, and you share with them. John Maxwell said, all you have to do to be a leader is to be one step ahead. One step. If you're one step ahead, you can lead this person here. This is the chair you want to avoid like the plague because now you're just sharing to chair number two and you're not receiving. And church, this is especially dangerous. What's well, dangerous for any believer, but especially leaders, pastors, Sunday school teachers, whatever the case may be. If you're not receiving, you're getting less and less to share. You're getting stagnant. If you're not careful, you're getting prideful. You're getting disconnected. Don't stay in that chair. Go to that chair when your person number two comes. Share with them. Absolutely. But then you get back in that chair and you receive and you pour out if you follow what I'm saying. That's an assessment. Lord, what chair am I in? What chair do I need to be in? Am I receiving? Because, church, we live in the information age. There is nothing that you should be struggling with. You can either get a podcast, a book, a video, a sermon, it's all out there. Amen, church? It is all out there. So you shouldn't be suffering in silence. And please come to me or your Sunday school teacher or your deacon. If you need help, we will help you. And if we don't, let me know type thing. So these three assessments, I, I'm pretty sure I got carried away and I left some notes here. So let me check and make sure because this is good stuff. You need to hear this. Hang on. John Maxwell so appropriately said that a real leader knows where he's going he knows how to get there and how to bring the resources to bear to make it happen while bringing others with him. So we've developed these three assessments to help us accomplish this goal. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is an invitation. And church, we're, we're, I'm begging you, if you're a child of God, to be begging God. If there's someone here that does not know Jesus and the free pardon of sin, that they'll walk during this uh, invitation, and I'll send you as someone gender appropriate. They'll share the gospel with you. Maybe you just need to come to the altar and deal with these assessments. Lord, I'm, I'm not following the Bethel approach very well. Lord, I, I didn't score very well on the BAMO assessment, whatever the case may be. Lord, I'm not in the right chair. I, I'm not even in a chair, whatever the case may be. Let's stand, musicians, will you come? Praying for changed lives. Have you noticed in 2024 that some things are just not as palatable as they were in 1994? 19, or 2004, 2014. There was a time for years in Brother Ben's life that hopefully you didn't need a lot out of me in the last week of March and the first week of April. <laughs> Because I had basketball games to watch. 
To my knowledge, I didn't watch one game all the way through this year. If I did, it was one. Why? It's not palatable anymore. One of the teams that I follow was involved in gross sin. It doesn't matter what type of sin. It was just gross sin. Now, church, you know that in the Old Testament, the word wicked simply means doing anything outside of the will of God. And I think it's important for us to realize that when we look at gross, what we call gross sin, God looks at our life, and if we're not following him, the instant obedience to the initial promptings to God, that is gross sin. And so we would do well to repent before God and to follow him as best we can. Let's sing. First to step out when you come.